Hello, and welcome to Product Momentum, where we hope to entertain, educate, and celebrate the amazing product people who are helping to shape your community's way ahead. My name is Paul Gable, and I'm the Director of Product Innovation at ITX. Along with my co-host, Sean Flaherty, and our amazing production team and occasional guest host, we record and release a conversation with a product thought leader, writer, speaker, or maker who has something to share with the community every two weeks. Hello and welcome to the pod. Today we're delighted to be joined by Scott Ambler. Scott lives in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. In addition to being a father and husband, he manages several additional roles, that being consulting methodologist, agile data coach, author, keynote speaker, and advisory board member. As a consulting methodologist, Scott helps people and teams improve their ways of working and their ways of thinking. In particular, he's focused on helping people apply agile data and agile modeling strategies. In 2010, Scott co-created the discipline Agile and with Mark Lyons, with, which led to the development of both the Agile modeling and Agile data methods. When he works with teams, Scott often takes on the role of Agile data coach, helping them to understand how to apply Agile data and Agile modeling strategies. Scott's co-written 28 books and hundreds of articles and white papers. Most of this writing has been about information technology, methods, and practices. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Appreciate you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Always, uh, always happy. Yeah, outstanding. And as a prolific writer, your contribution to the field is really appreciated. I've been excited for this conversation for a while. Just to open it up with a broad question to help us dig in here, the, the topic on the table today is AI and, and primarily the challenges that we're encountering in data quality. So to get us started, maybe you can help lay, lay out the field as you see it for how this Gen AI revolution or discovery for uh, many folks who haven't been exposed to it in this way before. How does data quality figure into your outlook on the, the next steps in this field? Yeah, so, so data quality is absolutely critical. The, you know, for AI, well, for, for a lot of things, if you're trying to make, you know, data-driven decisions, data warehousing, business intelligence, and now AI, and it becomes a garbage in, garbage out situation. It's really that straightforward. And I think what's happened is a lot of organizations have let their, their data technical debt or their data debt to increase over the years. I mean, they, they keep pushing it off and pushing it off. And now it's just built up. And the, frankly, the day, you know, it's time to pay the data piper. You've got to fix the, the data quality problems because the, the challenge with AI is it ingests this data. And if it's low quality, then you get a low quality answer. And because it's working at this, you know, at the speed of technology and the, the scope of the internet, you can have very serious, very large problems very, very quickly with AI. And, and this, I think is the challenge for a lot of organizations. And you're in the middle of it right now. You're literally halfway through your master's degree in AI. And both I and Sean are in academia as well and, and see AI becoming more and more sort of AI washed across many of the, of the disciplines. How crucial do you think it is for us to separate the hype from the, the substance of what AI's impact is on fields? seems like every time you turn around, there's an, uh, a, you know, product management with AI or any other respective field with AI. How far do you think the pendulum needs to swing before there's some correction, before there's some oscillation in our understanding of this intersection we're at right now? Yeah. So I think the, you know, we're still climbing the hype curve and, and maybe, you know, maybe we're pretty much hitting the peak, but it's a little frustrating for me. So like just before chat GPT came out, at least the 3.5 version came out. Last fall, I had decided to go back to school. And then so, and then like a month later it comes out and all this I ridiculous hype. So it's a bit frustrating because it looks like I'm jumping on a bandwagon when I'm really not. So I think the, you know, the challenge really is, is that there is a lot of hype. There's a lot of unrealistic expectations. I keep telling people that, you know, Gen like I love Gen AI. I think there's some really cool stuff going on and I, I, I use it for what I can, but fundamentally Gen AI, the purpose of it is to make stuff up. And so when I ask chat GPT something, yeah, it'll make up a good answer. And this is the thing that drives me nuts. Like some people give me hassle on this and I keep saying, well, wait a minute, you know, give it a prompt, get an answer. And then if you don't like that answer, you can ask for another answer and it'll give you a very different answer. And then again and again and again. So you can see it make up different things to the exact same prompt. Dali, uh, which I use a lot for you know, gen generating images. It's even more obvious when you, when you give it a prompt, it gives you four different images and then you can reprompt it or you know, select an image and say, give me something similar to this. And it generates out four things that are sort of similar to it. So yeah, it's just constantly making stuff up. So you get, you need to go in eyes wide open. And when, you know, as a professional, if you're using chat GPT to, 
right part of your report or part of a marketing strategy, you darn well better read and whatever it is you copy and paste, you darn well better read it and update it and, and make it your own. Having said that though, I think, yeah, ChatGPT is great for just bouncing ideas around. You can have a brainstorming, effectively have a brainstorming session very, very quickly. And, you know, give me 10 ideas about blah, blah, blah. And it'll come up with six or seven fairly decent ones and like, you know, a few just nonsense ones, but that's okay. As long as you're, you know, you're able to sift the nuggets out of the garbage, then I think you're good to go. But it, it all depends on how you're using it. But like I said, go on eyes wide open, use it appropriately. And I think there's a lot of value in uh, generative AI and, and other forms of AI too. Like Gen AI is the, you know, the big elephant in the room right now, but I'm, I'm hoping that once the hype curve goes down, we'll see people come, you know, start dealing with reality on, on the other, other forms of AI. So you talked about garbage in, garbage out, data debt, love that concept. We've all experienced it if we've been working on it in a, in a given domain for any period of time. Do you have any good examples of where this garbage in, garbage out, like this problem has manifest? I can't name names, but I've, I've worked with a couple of organizations now where, you know, they were you know, trying to do a pilot. A couple of them were trying to do pilots in AI, right? So they're mm -hmm. uh, a machine learning thing. And what happened was they started out with what they believe and, and fairly believed to be a, a six month pilot in AI to figure out what they could do and save the universe or whatever the goal was. And they very quickly realized they had a multi-year data quality cleansing problem. So, you know, because their production data we just had too many problems with it and, and bias and, and, and just basic quality problems and it derailed them. And I think this is something we're going to see more and more. So even though there's a lot of hype around using professionals like us using Gen AI to generate text or, you know, images or whatever, or music or whatever you're into, which is great. So augmentation of humans. I think the, you know, the real bang for your buck is going to be in organizations training, you know, using machine learning and, 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 so, and in some, and in some cases, large language models, like, like we see in Gen AI, um, but training their own models and particularly narrow of Gen AI. Um, but to do that, they need better quality data. And so they're gonna have to clean up their data. So it's going to be several years for a lot of, you know, particularly, you know, the fortune 500 companies, the insurance companies of the world and the banks and. They're all suffering from these problems and I think it's come to a head now. So I think we're going to see over the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing more and more business processes or portions of business processes automated uh, by AI. Hopefully that will improve the life of the workers and, you know, truly augment what they do. But, you know, it, it'll, it'll be a couple of years, but I think there's going to be a lot of easy kills. You know, like I said, writing reports and, you know, improving, you know, small little activities. Uh, that we do day to day, but uh, not like full end to end automation. And that'll be a few years away from most companies. And it'll be because of the data that they just uh, either don't have the data or the data they have is just not where it needs to be. Seems to me a great use of AI would be to clean up historical data. Yeah, it is. Uh, we're seeing some tools that can do that, you know, certainly point out where the problems are. But yeah, to be fair, like, yeah, I, I do a lot of work in the data warehousing. At least I used to do a lot of work in the data warehousing community. And they've been pointing out data quality problems for a long time. A very common thing for a data warehouse is to you know, feedback when they, cause they're getting, they're ingesting data from all these legacy sources, just like the AIs would. And the data warehousing people, if they're doing the proper job, they're seeding back logs of, you know, here's the data quality problems we're running into. It'd be really nice if you fix them uh, because it's not their responsibility. Right. And, and rightfully so, but. Problem is, is nobody, the people that, you know, whatever team or whatever group in your organization owns those data sources, often they're not fixing the data quality problems um, because they're big and, and it's expensive and it takes time. So, so fair enough. So I think what's happening now is that, and you can get away with it because with, in the data warehousing and business intelligence world, because it, it fundamentally we always be humans, right? The, the end consumer of the, of the information is a human, and then they can make a decision based on the report or the widgets on the screen or whatever. The challenge now with the AI is that the AI is the end consumer of the data and it's making decisions. So if it can't tell that this data doesn't make sense or the information in the report is nonsense, it won't be able to detect, to detect that. So it's going to, it'll make a decision based on what it's being told, told from the data and then, you know, garbage in, garbage out at that point. So I think this is why the data quality issue is come to such a head with AI is that 
that last, it's the equivalent of the last mile from telecom, right? The last mile in the data space before AI was a human that could make a decision and could filter out the garbage from the good stuff. And the problem is now is the AI can't do that. And what happens is you, you, know, you build the AI, you test it, and you, and you get nonsense coming out of it. And it's like, oh, we can't deploy that. <laughs> so, you know, glad, glad it took us six months to figure that out. And this is why we're seeing such a huge failure rate in uh, AI uh, projects. You know, the, the, well, the success rate's like between 15 and 20%, if you, if you believe what's coming out of some of the, the consulting companies. And, and that, that seemed pretty reasonable to me. Well, it, it seems horrendous, but it, it, it seems like an accurate number, uh, a very unfortunate, uh, but an accurate number. Yeah. I, I want to use a phrase that you mentioned in our chat before the show. It, it was around the topic of just sort of the social aspect and sort of the zeitgeist that everybody and their dog has a- access to chat GPT now and, and others. So Google's coming out with theirs. Elon has his meta has their own large language models and, and there's sort of a quickly saturating space now. And I don't think we even have the words to define the things that we're experiencing. Like one, for example, that comes to mind is I feel like I can kind of tell when a social media post has been written by chat GPT. You, yeah. I, I can't quite put my finger on why or how I know it, but you use it enough and you can kind of tell that's an AI thing. And having this sense of misplaced trust is a really, I think, core element to either driving that success rate from 15 to 20% up or just saying that's as good as it's going to get. And the last mile is where we need to focus as human beings, because that's where the actual value add comes. This is sort of the crux of what I've been looking forward to digging into with you. How do we as people rightly understand trust in this AI space? And I realize that's a very broad question, but I can't think of how to narrow it down. Maybe you can help me refine the question as you answer it. So that's a, that is a great observation because I, now the unfortunate thing is that people trust the information coming out of the AIs more than they trust the, the similar information coming out of people. It's just this weird sociological thing and which is not the answer you'd be looking for, but it is right. So I think even when you get this gut feel of, oh, that's not quite right. Well, it's coming out of the computer it must be right. And that's like the level of thinking for most people. And that is a horrible, horrible thing, but that's the reality on the grounds. So what that tells me is we need to get a lot better at determining, you know, whether or not something is ready to go and like ready to deploy. And then once it is deployed, monitoring it. I always like to use the example of a few years ago, Microsoft released a a chat bot into the wild. And after 19 hours, they had to pull it from production because it became a raving racist. And it was recommending, you know, we need to go out and kill certain groups of people and and stuff like that. And what had happened was they had pointed it at some right-wing discussion groups and, you know, it did its thing. So at at, at the speed of the internet, right? So luckily they pulled it, right? Like luckily they were keeping an eye on it because they, I think they inherently knew that this could go poorly. So we better keep an eye on it. And sure enough, it went poorly really quickly and uh, they pulled it, but but, you know, it might not happen as well. So, you know, you could put an insurance fraud AI in place, right? And, and I've, I've been involved with stuff like this. And the, you know, there, so there, there will be bias in your data. So whatever data you've got, it reflects the realities of your business processes, which are implemented by humans. And humans are biased. It's just it is what it, you know, regardless of what you might think, there, there is always some bias. So your data will reflect that bias in your people following your business processes. So then when you train your AI on that, the biases will come out. So part of the training process has to be to detect any bias, whatever biases are there. You won't get them all uh, because you'll get some of them and you you want to have diverse teams and all that sort of stuff. But you know, you're the people training these AIs are only human. So they're, they're also going to make mistakes as well, but hopefully you'll do better. So you'll, you'll get rid of some of the bias, but not all of it. But the remaining bias um, has the potential to get out of hand really quickly or really slowly, <laughs> which is hard to detect. So as your uh, models start making questionable decisions, because um, there could be certain gr- like small groups of people that, you know, your, your insurance fraud system is saying, oh, no, what's what? they're one of those people. Um, of course, it's committing fraud. So let's go investigate that, uh, you know, that group because they live in a certain neighborhood or, or whatever. And that sort of stuff can be really hard to detect. Uh, and, and there's, and there's wonderful case studies. There's a wonderful book, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. 
it just contains horror stories of well-intentioned people building what they believe to be good systems. And then the side effects were unpalatable. So, you know, very, very, you know, anybody doing AI needs to read that book or pretty much anything Kathy re- writes, but certainly that book. Outstanding. I, I think the, the, one of the phrases that keeps kind of ringing in my ears is the signal to noise ratio, right? You regenerate response after response. And there's also a recursion that starts to take place where there's such a corpus of AI generated content, both visually with Dali and, and written word that now it seems that the, the models are now feeding themselves. And there's sort of this yeah. capitalistic tendency towards ingesting previous AI art to make new AI art and previous AI writing to make new AI writing. And it seems to be a slippery slope that seems dangerous on the face. But again, I don't know that I have the words to define what it is we're even talking about yet. Well, that, yeah, frankly, the, like the output from chat GPT-4 is virtually impossible to detect that it's been written by, you know, by an AI from what I can tell. And at least it's very, very difficult. So if you're publishing a web page based on that output, how do you detect it? We need some sort of a, I've been thinking deeply about this. We, we need some sort of a way to indicate that content is produced solely by people. And we're seeing more and more of that when you submit to certain journals and certain, you know, certain pu- you know, publishers. Now you've got to say, yes, I, I, I did not use AI to generate any of this content, but we need a, like a, a general international strand. And that's where it's all going to fall apart is doing it internationally. So there'll be multiple ways of doing this and, you know, there'll be great arguments, but we need to be able to indicate, you know, what's human generated content and what isn't. But then you've still got the problem that you know, some of the human generated content is crap as well. So, you know, there's a lot of very questionable writings produced by humans that it's also being ingested in these AIs, uh, which is why the chatbot became a raving racist. Well, because it was ingesting racist opinions being published by people and it just, and it just spiraled from there. You, you said earlier that people trust AI more than they trust other people. I'm just curious in that study, did, was it, did the people know it was AI? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they were looking at, and it's not just AI, it's just information coming out of the computer. The computer must be right. That's the level of thinking. And so, yeah, so there, there's greater trust in what, what a computer produces in general than what people produce because yeah, that number must be right. You're, you get your telecom bill, you know, as, you know, pretending you still get it on paper, you know, your telecom bill comes every month. It's gotta be right produced by the, the computers at you know, AT&T or whoever your provider is. This is the level of thinking, unfortunately. So we've essentially been trained to believe yeah. that computers don't mistake. So, yeah. right? so, so it's, it's kind of bled over into our ethos about AI. That's an interesting concept. So I want to dig into how a product manager looking at a platform, a piece of software, a new product they're trying to release into the world can reconcile the signal to noise ratio, for lack of a better term. I think the project manager, product manager, delivery team that's trying to ship software, now, I, I think is in a position where it's very tempting to rely on tools to generate requirements, to adapt user interfaces in more dynamic ways. The The appeal is strong. And if it were to work out in, in an ideal world, it really is a force multiplier to be reckoned with. It, it is a hundred percent, a productivity boon. And I think it, it's difficult or impossible to ignore at this point in time, but integrating it into our existing workflows, whether it's agile or waterfall or whatever framework you, you may be working in this product manager, it, you know, it, it entering the field or, or maturing their career is looking at how do I deal with these new tool sets where the rules haven't been written, regulations are still amorphous. People don't know what to trust or who's writing it a line of code or a, a fact or figure that my UI is displaying. It bring us back down to, to terra firma from, from strategy mountain that we've been living on for a minute. What does a product manager do with this nexus that we're looking at where a new technology is you know, brand new and, and being built before our eyes and we still have to get work done. And, and now the expectations from maybe people who don't understand it are now, well, now you should be able to do this 10 times faster or, or uh, 10 times better. How, how do you arm a person like that with the knowledge they need to handle these brand new questions? Well, I, I think you need, I think people need to be open about what they're doing. So, so for example, you mentioned, you know, the use case of generating requirements from chat GPT or something. 
that's a great idea. But at the same time, you know, if, if, if a product manager is doing that and just copying, pasting straight, they deserve what they get. It's a super simple, but if they're treating it like a brainstorming session with just between them and a computer, great. Cause it's still fundamentally their decision, right? All they're doing is getting some you know extra feedback very quickly, but they could have go done a Google search. But the thing is you do a Google search and then you got to read all these articles or what, whatever comes up. Whereas, you know, if you, if you use one of the AIs like Bing or whatever, then it'll, it'll start giving a fairly decent answer. Now, sometimes all it's doing is regurgitating an existing article. So you better click on and you know, see where, it, where it came from. But, you know, others are, you know, they, you know, you can ask it for, give me 25 ideas around this and it'll come up, but you still got to process them yourself and, and choose the, the 10 that were good ideas for you in your, in your situation. And so effectively, it's still your, and, and you're going to tweak it anyways, right? You know, point number seven will be something and then you'll reword it to make sense for your situation. So. It's just effectively, you know, and, and it's a lot faster, you know, that easily will be a force multiplier compared to, you know, having a, even like just like a conference call where you get like 10 people together and then you've got to sift through all their ideas. Right. So there, there are some opportunities for doing that, but what I would do is I would look for opportunities where I could use the AIs to speed up one task or one part of the process. And use it as, as input into whatever it is that I'm trying to, trying to do there, but I'm still making the decision. I, it's still my material going into, or my ideas, um, after seeing what came out of the AI, um, I, you know, so you got to own it basically. And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of uh, force multiplication but to your point though, this is changing so quickly. This is, this is a highly competitive field and it's like any, any tech, um, fad, right? You, you get this huge burst of, of semi-innovation, I guess you would say, with like hundreds or thousands of, of potential options. And then, you know, five years later, you're down to the top five, right? And, and this is the way this is going to play out as well. So I think, but right now we're in that several hundred options to choose from point. So yeah, you, you've got to keep an eye on it. And because this does change, you know, talk to your, talk to your friends. And uh, I think there's a lot of, I've seen a few groups professional groups now where they're, they're basically having meetups of let's share what you're doing and what tool, let's talk about the tools and strategies that you're using for AI, you know, applying AI in your job. And I think that's a beautiful idea. And for the next couple of years, that'll be absolutely critical for a lot of groups. Yeah. You yeah. used the phrase when we were chatting before the show, that there's no magic. It's just hard work. And it's, <laughs> it's really my, my top takeaway. Sean, what yeah, they? there is, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's a, for, it, it, you want to think it's magic. And I guess like on, on the very high level surface, it is magical. Like chat, you know, the, you know, some of these AI, these gen AI AIs are just incredible. Like I said, I use Dali a lot because I don't have artistic talent whatsoever. So, and you know, I'll, I'll use it to generate a few images that, you know, I'll use in presentations and whatever, but you know, back in the day when I had staff, I, I had a full-time graphic artist and it would, you know, for the images that I'm getting out of Dali in like five minutes, I would have spent several days going back and forth with her of, you know, this is what I want. And can you do this? No, it's not what I want. Can, what about this? Or I like that, but I really need like this. So we'd go back and forth for, for several days until finally we came to the idea of, oh, that's it. Okay. Make a clean version of that. And, and she'd go off and do a great job. Now I can do pretty much the same thing in Dali in five minutes. So there's some very interesting stuff going on there, but it really does get down to, but there's no magic, right? It's just, it, you know, Dali ingested millions of, of pictures in it, which is why it can draw like that. And I think the, we really need to understand that this is happening and there's some very interesting IP challenges there. We may have to give up on copyright. I, I was in a conversation earlier today about that very issue where I, I'm pretty generous with my, with my IP and which has always been, you know, strange for a lot of people. And, and I said, now it's like, yeah, I've got some copy. I, I do have a lot of copyrighted material, but I can't fight that battle. I just don't have, I don't have the resources. Yes. And I know it's been stolen. I know without a doubt, it's been ingested by all these AIs and there's nothing I can do about it. I got to give up, but yeah, you know, whatever. And uh, move on. I just don't have the resources to fight those battles. And I think we need to, to understand this. That's interesting for the creators out there. It's a scary yeah, interesting. 
I got, so along this theme of there's no magic, it's all hard work. I got a couple of takeaways I'd like to share with the audience sure. from my crazy mind, from all the things that you said here. And the first one is, I think one of the top engineering use cases that I haven't heard a lot about that is often overlooked is this concept of using AI to cleanse data. And you, you mentioned, you know, we're still years out from it being super useful in the context of large data sets because of the, the health of the data. And I think there's a huge opportunity there. There's a, there's a gap. And, and maybe an opportunity because, you know, it has the, at the very least, it has the ability to show us where the data, where the data problems are or where they're congregating, or maybe even where they're coming from that, you know, that, that's a big opportunity. Second big takeaway, I think that I captured is that as a society, I think this is a cool one, actually, I might post about this one. As a society, we've actually built this cognitive bias that didn't exist before because of technology, like technology has caused us this cognitive bias around believing that the technology is probably more right than the people we interact with. I think that's a cool insight and something that, especially as product leaders, we need to be very careful of. Like that bias is real. It's legit. And it's scary. And I, you know, I, as I look back, I, I've fallen prey to that. I'm sure we all have. So we, we need to be aware of it or we can't do anything with it. The third is that we can use AI. You said something about speeding up a part of the process, you know, which is a, it's a first principle in, in any software industry, right? So in any software endeavors to break the problem down into smaller parts so that you can fix them. Well, we could do that or we should be doing that with AI. Like what are the small parts of the problems that we could take AI and help solve them? And that applies to design. You, you talked a lot about using DALI to solve design problems. It applies to engineering. We can break down some of these engineering problems and maybe think differently about how to apply AI to solve components of the problem. I thought that was brilliant. And then the last one is that AI is not going to be the easy ticket, but it can help us significantly speed up our decision-making ability and our, you know, it can, it can help us refine, this is what I've been using it for primarily, is to refine information, yeah. it sort of spark ideas. It's, it's not a tool yet anyway to, that can fully create for us, but it can certainly help us make better decisions and help us help guide us in ways that we haven't been able, it makes us more efficient in ways that we haven't been able to take advantage of before. Any reflections on those takeaways? Yeah, I, I think they're all solid. I, yeah, I think one challenge though we, is that AI can in fact uh, solve bigger problems, um, but the problem is you don't want to trust it. <laughs> so I think, so you really want to use AI, fix it, you know, address a small, a small problem or a small issue, and then make sure it's clean and then go on to the next thing and so on. So have the humans in the loop. I think it's critical. So, you know, for example, if from a programming point of view, you can generate lots and lots of source code to, to build websites. I've, I've seen demos of this. It, it's absolutely fascinating, but it's, do you really want to trust that code? Whereas, you know, I've also seen people use Copilot for, give me a, a small function to do blah, blah, blah. And the code is solid. Now you still need to test it and you need to know, you know what you're doing, but I would trust like small little snippets of, of code yeah, after I've you know, eyeballed it and made sure it actually works. I certainly wouldn't trust you know, several hundred lines of code written by, it, written by some, some co-pilot. Uh, yeah, it might work, but I, there could be some very interesting security problems there that would get past me because it's hard to look at. A big, it's hard to review and, and fix a big thing. It's pretty straightforward to review and fix a small thing. And I think it's the, that, you know, keep the humans in the loop for the small things, at, at least for now, you know, maybe, you know, five, 10 years, I could be completely wrong. I could be what, building entire systems in five minutes. Who knows? I doubt it, but you never know. But certainly now only use it for small things and make sure humans are, are in the loop. Sound advice. Scott, there's two questions that we ask all of our guests at the end of our show. Is, and the first is actually interesting because you've used the word a couple of times already. The first question we ask is, what is the definition of innovation to you? When you hear the word innovation, especially germane to the space that we've been in for the past half hour or so, what does the word innovation mean when you hear that? Wow, great question. So machine defining words. Um, I'm not Webster, damn it. But anyways, the, no, I think innovation to me is our new ideas or new combinations of ideas in in a context. So, because very few innovations are truly, are truly new, right? It's usually the application of existing ideas and combinations thereof in a new context where, you know, those, those, that idea, those ideas that haven't been applied before. So I think it's, you know, standing on the shoulders of, of giants type of thing. Awesome. 
The second question is, what are you reading these days? So what are you, what's, what's intriguing to you? What kind of books are you reading these days? Well, because I'm in school, I have been doing a lot of reading in deep learning and machine learning and all this sort of stuff, just, just from, and you know, incredible numbers of papers around AI. But on the side, I'm actually for fiction, I'm rereading Lord of the Rings. And so going through each book one at a time, and then I'm, I'm forcing myself to not watch the movie until after I've read the book. So I'm, I'm most of the way through Two Towers right now. I, I reread The Lord of the Rings probably every every 10 years or so. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching Two Towers probably over between Christmas and New Year's. But uh, yeah, so it's that. I'm, I've actually got a book over the side, uh, 25, I think it's something along the lines of 25 possible uses of AI. I think the HBR AI books list this year. So it's a, it seems to be a pretty interesting, uh, interesting book. I mean, these authors are all, you know, the godfathers and sometimes godmothers of the AI field and writing of their various ideas. So a lot I, of good stuff. I, I saw a cold light up when you said Lord of the Rings. I think it's required reading in our domain for sure. It is. Oh. Deep, deep, rich goodness. We'll, we'll be sure to list all those books in the show notes, as well as the other that you mentioned, Weapons of Math Destruction, which I'm looking forward to cracking open. But Scott, it's been a pleasure getting a peek inside your mind and, and thoughts on the space. Really pragmatic, hands-on approach to how to deal with these very new and, and sometimes intimidating ideas. So thanks for breaking this down for us and helping approach this with a really level-headed, I think, set of ideals and principles. So yeah, it, it's been a blast. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's it for today. In line with our goals of transparency and listening, we really want to hear from you. Sean and I are committed to reading every piece of feedback that we get, so please leave a comment or a rating wherever you're listening to this podcast. Not only does it help us continue to improve, but it also helps the show climb up the rankings so that we can help other listeners move, touch, and inspire the world just like you're doing. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next episode. Mm-hmm.